Did you know that the MBA is by far and away the most successful degree of the 20th century? And it ain't even close. So in 1907, there were zero MBAs given out in the world. And by the end of the 20th century, 90 years later, 27% of all students in America, and I use America as a, a representative of this, 27% of all students in a graduate program in America were in an MBA program. So it grew from nothing to by far, by more than a factor of two times, bigger than any other form of graduate education uh, in, in America. Similarly for, uh, uh, for Canada and increasingly similarly uh, around the world. So that's an incredible thing to come from nothing to market share leadership by, by far and away. So partially this is good news. It means this is a kind of a useful thing to do. So you all are not doing something, uh, something silly here thinking about doing an MBA. That is the very good news about uh, business uh, education. The less good news, I would argue, is what goes along with being unbelievably successful. So MBA education, unbelievably successful, phenomenal growth from zero degrees to 150,000 a year given, given out in, a, in America. The problem with many successful businesses is they get complacent. And why would they be complacent? It's because they're so darn successful. You can put on an MBA program and people will flood to it. That was the story for 90 years, at least, of the 20th century, and I think it's continued into the, into the 21st uh, century. So this is a problem that often happens with highly successful institutions, highly successful uh, industries. They get complacent. And I would argue that that is why we have to be innovative in business education. And that's why we've chosen the path we, we have, which is to innovate, to not be complacent in an industry that is monumentally complacent, monumentally complacent. I go to you know, industry association types of uh, things and speechify at them, and I, and I just think it's a complacent uh, industry. We will not be complacent because we don't think that's a good idea for the, uh, for the industry. And I think there are three dimensions on which we have to be different than the general MBA business in order to be an innovator and in order to hopefully show the way forward for MBA education. And I don't know if there's, there's a slide coming in, no? Are there any slides? Oh, look, that's me. Here we go. Excellent. Um, so what I'd argue is that for an MBA, for business education, there's three dimensions you could think about. And you could think about a bad side of each of these dimensions and a good side of each of these dimensions. So you would want a business education, an MBA, not to be shallow, but to be deep. Now, what would a shallow business education be? I think a shallow business education would be one in which you're taught tools, but you're not taught enough about how to use them. You don't understand the models that lay beneath the tools that you're taught, so that when you go out into the world, rather than being able to carefully use them, intelligently uh, use them, not go beyond their natural limitations, you go flying right by them because all you know is the tool and not the reasoning behind it. So we've come up with many theories and tools in the world of business education. Two clever guys, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes, came up with a way to value options at a time when people didn't know how to think about these new things called options. And they came up with what many of you here would, would, would know, many of you probably use the Black-Scholes Option Pricing Theorem. And that was great. That's a bunch of great business knowledge. But interestingly enough, if you read what Fisher Black and Myron Scholes actually said, they said, you know what, if you would like to value an option on a non-dividend paying stock, 
and an option of less than six months duration and a European, not American, call option, use this formula. Now, and they said, and if it's anything else, this ain't a good idea. Don't do it. Right? So why do you think when executives get stock options that are, let's say, in a nice dividend paying company and they vest over a three year period and they're, because it's in America, they're actually American, not European uh, options. They don't just, uh, uh, they aren't just exercisable on one day at the final, uh, final day. Why do you think we value those using the Black-Scholes option pricing theorem? Why do you think, in fact, accounting firms vouch that these are accurate estimations of options for purposes of the financial statements? I think it's because business education spewed out a whole bunch of people who have a shallow understanding of the models that they were taught, not a deep understanding of the models they were taught. So they over apply these models and they can over apply these models in ways that can have disastrous uh, consequences for economies because I think a whole lot of that went on in uh, 2005, 6, 7, 8. So what we've really focused on here at the school is saying we need to teach our students how to really, truly, deeply understand the models that they're gonna go out and use. That is very much part of the integrative thinking agenda where we teach students to be model builders, to actually build models, to audit models, to understand models, right? So that, in the words of my friend Miknia, so that rather than being owned by their models, Right? They own their models and they can use their models in sophisticated ways, not the unsophisticated way that I've just, I've just described. So rather than shallow, we have an agenda to teach you to be deep thinkers so that you can be problem solvers for the world. That's one dimension. Second dimension, narrow versus broad. On this front, what I would argue is that business education has, to too great an extent, narrowed for convenience. It's narrowed in a couple of ways uh, for, for its convenience. One is it's narrowed into disciplinary silos for the convenience of doing research in a narrow field. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that in the words of great, the great, greatest management thinker of the 20th century, Peter Drucker, there are no finance problems, there are no marketing problems, there are no accounting problems, there are no tax problems, there are only what kind of problems? Business problems, right? So actually the world doesn't fit nicely and neatly into narrow disciplinary silos. The problems, the presenting problems, the presenting choices of the world actually slosh across boundaries of those, of those disciplines. But it's much harder to think, to create theories, right? When you're thinking more broadly, taking into account broader things. So my favorite thing to do in the world of business education is to hold all of that other things constant and say, if all of that other stuff where it's constant and not, nothing happening over there, uh, this is how this dynamic would work. You know, and that's kind of, it's not like that it has no utility, but it's not as though it has massive utility either. The other thing, so narrowing within disciplinary silos is one piece, but the other thing business education has, has done, I would argue to too great an extent, is to ignore vast tracts of the world in order to focus on what's easier and more convenient to focus on. Right? So it's inclined to say, you know what? We're gonna study the business sector. And if, if government would just stay away, kind of that would be 
that would be really good, right? uh, because that that complicates uh, that complicates things, right? uh, and uh, and it, make, it makes it harder to kind of think and and, uh, and analyze, and we don't really want to think too much about the impact of what businesses do on society in general because that's kind of complicated too. Let's think about business doing its thing and governments and NGOs doing their thing. Now I think this is changing some, but I think business education has been slow to actually try and build these things into its models to say this is about how this kind of entity business interacts with society as a whole, and how does that work? What is the role of a, of a corporation more broadly than taking care of its shareholders? Do they need to contrib contribute to building the communities in which they, they uh, work or not? And how can we build theory that, that, uh, that thinks about that? So on this front, the narrow versus broad, we have a number of initiatives underway. One is, again, integrative thinking, where we're teaching our students to be able to think across models. So yes, we're gonna teach them the finance models that are taught in finance programs around the world, marketing models, accounting models. They're like a lingua franca of the business world, and so we've gotta teach those models. But we'll also teach you how to think about when the model you learned in marketing or the model you learned in finance or the model you learned in accounting conflicts with a model you learned in one of those other disciplines. So rather than having you say, my job, my job as a business person is to when what I learned in finance conflicts with what I learned in marketing, right? I, my job is to pick which of those two models is superior in dealing with this problem, right? And then ignore the other model. Ignore the little voice in your ear that says, but that other model says that's just absolutely wrong. That's not the thing you ought to be doing. Rather, we will teach you how to say, how can I build a model that's better, that takes into account both of the, those underlying models so that I can come up with a better answer? That, again, Problem solvers for the world, that's what we're producing. That'll make you able to solve real problems in the world, not fake -o, narrow problems that are created in some kind of case. The other thing we've done, and, and, and McNeil uh, referred to it, is the Martin Prosperity Institute. We have made a huge thrust into understanding how, how corporations interact with jurisdictions, whether they be cities, megacities, regions to produce prosperity or, or not, and building new great theory on that front. Rather than just saying, oh, you should pay attention to it, we want to be able to give advice on that and have our graduates be able to go out into the world and do something useful uh, on, on that front, not uh, ignore it. We also have something called the Leach and Family Institute for Corporate Citizenship that's exploring the role of corporations generally in society, and what does it mean to be a useful, productive corporate citizen, right? As opposed to a narrow corporate citizen that says, as Milton Friedman said, the business of business is business. We make money, we pay, pay dividends to shareholders, and then they can save the world. Yeah. Fair enough, I mean, it's not a bad start, but isn't there a better, bolder theory that we can have on that front is what we're, is what we're asking. So in each of these areas, right, we're doing fundamental research of a different sort that's being done, unique sorts of research that will help us produce deep and broad graduates. Third dimension, last dimension, is static versus dynamic. And on this front, I think what has happened is that the world of business education has focused too much on, the, on a form of decision making, which is to help people gain the tools that would enable them, if they're given two options, three, four, five, however many options, but let's just say two for the sake, uh, the sake of argument, analysis 
analytical techniques that help them, help them choose which is the better option. Okay. And I think this came out of kind of an, uh, of a, of an era, era when we were getting all excited about new analytical uh, techniques for measuring things. There was operations research and the like. And so we said, that's the job. Uh, the, these people called managers are, are going to have situations in which they have, they have multiple options and we've got to help them figure out which is the, the, which is the best. Now, is this a bad idea? No, it's, it's not a bad idea, just, li just like being able to, to have deep research in particular disciplines is not, a, is not a, a bad idea. But is it the thing that really makes a difference in the world? Do we laud write books about the like CEOs or leaders, business leaders in general, who when, when faced with two options, figured out which was better. Right? Is that why everybody and their cousin is reading the Steve Jobs book? Because that's what Steve Jobs did. I don't think so. I think the great value add that a leader can, can, uh, can create and the so, and what the great leaders do is create options that do not now exist. Right? And you could argue, I think that's Steve Jobs' entire career, is creating options, creating, creating, uh, creating options and then pursuing them, things that did not previously exist. And that is having a dynamic view of business. It's not just the here and now, it's inventing that which does not now exist. And that's where, again, McNeil mentioned design works. We've made a huge, huge investment in bringing the best of design education and design thinking into the business school domain. Because the good thing about design schools is that they spend however many years, four years, asking their students to create things that do not now exist giving them methodologies for doing them, giving them practice for do that, doing that, while business education spends its MBA two years, I think, telling, uh, teaching students how to choose from among the existing options uh, uh, facing them. Once again, I think we need to do what the rest of the business school business does, which is we will teach you techniques for choosing among existing options, but, but believe you me, we will teach you how to think systematically about creating that which does not now exist, which is the highest value added thing I think a business leader can do. So I believe that the current, the current uh, state of business education is that, is that little box where it's narrow, shallow, and static. And it can do that because it is massively successful. Now, the only thing about things that are massively successful right, is that massive success is a description of the past. I believe, I really be uh, believe that business education is cruising for a proverbial bruising if it stays in this box because the world is getting a little bit tired of shallow, narrow, static MBAs heading out into the world and being narrow and shallow and static. That's why, you know, yeah, I always have to look at these, look at these markers, but, but that's why FedEx commercials make fun of MBAs, right? It's out there. Um, and that's why this is the strategy. If you want to know at a broadest level the strategy of this school, what we've been dedicated to in the last 13 years, is to be able to provide a broad, deep, and dynamic business education. Now, if you're worried that you won't get what's over here, narrow, shallow, and, uh, and static, we understand. We gotta teach all the things that, uh, uh, that you'd get at other, other schools that are in that, in that uh, neck of the woods. Uh, but we don't do the either or thing because we wrote the book on integrative thinking and we say we just do and. We're going to do that and 
help you express your natural broadness. People aren't naturally narrow, by the way. They get pushed to be narrow. We're going to help you express your natural broadness. We're going to help you use your natural curiosity to go deeper. And we're going to help you think about and express and develop your creativity potential that will enable you to be a dynamic business leader. And that is what we're up to here at the Rotman School. And it's been a fun journey, uh, and we're going to continue on that, uh, on that journey. And our fond hope here is that we will play a significant role in saving business education from itself uh, and helping it get out of the, the success trap.